Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today. I'll just give a minute or so for folks to trickle in. Welcome. We're just going to give folks another minute or so to get out of the waiting room. Great. Well, maybe we'll go ahead and get started. And as folks join us, um, we can just get going. Um, so welcome. Thank you for joining today's webinar on exploring Vera's plastic program and plastic credits. A recording of this webinar will be available on Vera's YouTube channel later in the day, and you all will get a follow-up email with the presentation and a link to the recording of this webinar for your future reference. And if you have any questions throughout today's webinar, please go ahead and submit those throughout the Q&A function. We will have time at the end to do a bit of Q&A and hopefully get any questions that you have answered. But we'll just start with some quick introductions. So I'm Kaylee, Senior Program Officer of Plastics Policy and Markets here at Vera, and I will turn it over to Kristen to introduce herself. Thank you, Kaylee. I'm a manager also on our plastics policy and markets team, supporting Kaylee with general market and outreach for the plastic program. And I've been at Vera for about three years working on the plastic program in Vera, various capacities. Wonderful. So I'll just briefly introduce our agenda. We'll kind of start with an overview of plastic pollution and their challenges. And then we'll dive into Vera's plastic program, how to develop a project, a few project examples, leveraging Vera's plastic program and plastic credits, touch on the plastic credit market, and then we'll go into those Q&As. So again, just please submit any questions throughout the session in the question and answer function. But to start, if you're not familiar with VERA already, VERA is the world's leading standard setter for climate action and sustainable development. So VERA oversees the world's premier voluntary carbon markets initiative, including the Verified Carbon Standard, alongside a comprehensive array of other programs such as our Climate, Community, and Biodiversity Standard, the Sustainable Development and Verified Impact Standard, and the Plastic Waste Reduction Standard. And Vera engages with governments, corporations, and civil society to advance the adoption and responsible use of these standards. Currently, there are about over 3,000 projects spanning across 85 different countries worldwide. So I think a lot of us are very familiar with the growing problem of plastic waste and that it's become a top priority for companies, governments, and consumers. And to begin, we're just going to dive a bit into some of these challenges within the context of Latin America. So in 2020, approximately 3.7 million tons of plastic pollution from the Latin America and Caribbean region made its way into the ocean. And despite the fact that 81% of waste generated in the region is collected, less than 10% of this waste is actually recycled. And this discrepancy highlights a critical gap in the existing waste management systems and underscores the need for improved recycling infrastructure. Additionally, marine plastic pollution not only threatens our marine ecosystems, but poses a serious economic risk. In many Latin American and Caribbean countries in particular, tourism is a major economic driver, contributing from anywhere between 15 to 50% of their GDP. As plastic pollution affects beaches and marine environments, it jeopardizes the tourism industry. And given the importance of removing plastic pollution from the environment, it's essential to recognize the role of waste workers, who are pivotal in migrating these challenges. 
In the Latin America and Caribbean region, informal recycling workers are responsible for about 50% of all recycling activities. This substantial contribution underscores their critical role in managing and reducing waste. However, despite their importance, informal waste workers face many challenges. Many work in hazardous conditions with limited safety protections and are frequently excluded from important regional and global policy discussions that affect their work and well being. And lastly, as we look ahead, it's clear there's a significant funding gap for waste management efforts. By 2040, we face about a $40 billion funding gap for waste management. And Sustainable Development Goal 14, which addresses life below water, is the least financed SDG, revealing a critical need for more investment in combating marine plastic pollution. Moreover, developing economies are particularly concerned about how they will financially support obligations outlined in the Global Plastics Treaty. And all of these challenges underscore the necessity for innovative financial mechanisms to support the financing needed for infrastructure development that minimizes plastic pollution. So to start, we're just gonna give an overview of Vera's plastic program as an investment mechanism that catalyzes plastic waste management efforts. To start, I just wanna show this quick diagram that really illustrates some key elements relevant to the plastic program and its relevant stakeholders. So to start, Vera serves as the standard setter for collection and recycling projects. Then there are accredited third-party auditors who evaluate the conformance with the plastic program requirements and confirm the outcomes of collection and recycling efforts. Subsequently, Vera examines project documentation and audit reports issuing one plastic credit for every ton collected and recycled beyond baseline rates. After plastic credits are issued on Vera's registry, businesses have the opportunity to procure plastic credits, enabling them to make reputable investments in plastic waste management. The credible investment enhances the impact of plastic waste and collection recycling projects. So Vera's plastic program offers organizations an exceptional opportunity to enhance plastic stewardship by investing in downstream solutions. And the program encompasses the plastic standard as well as accompanying methodologies for plastic waste collection and recycling. And the standard really serves as this consistent framework for measuring and monitoring project impacts and integrating social and environmental safeguards. Additionally, within the plastic program, projects have the capacity to generate plastic credits. And these credits certified under the plastic program are issued to projects that have undergone third party audits and enable corporates to finance initiatives aimed at establishing and expanding plastic waste and collect plastic waste collection and recycling infrastructure. So plastic credits really serve as a financial mechanism to help invest in global plastic waste collection and recycling projects. Each credit represents the collection and or recycling of one additional ton of plastic waste. And these credits really bolster the waste management efforts by facilitating infrastructure development as well as expansion. Moreover, they enable projects to enhance worker livelihoods, health and safety standards, while also complementing upstream targets and actions. So there are two types of plastic credits under Vera's plastic program. There are waste collection credits, and these credits are issued according to the amount of plastic waste collected and properly managed, exceeding what would have occurred without the plastic program project. Collection credits really enable organizations to invest directly in collecting plastic waste from the environment and establishing systems to prevent further pollution. Also, there are waste recycling credits, and these credits are issued based on the amount of waste recycled, surpassing what would have happened without a plastic program project. Recycling credits help facilitate the scaling of recycling infrastructure, as well as the generation of recycled plastic feedstock that can substitute virgin plastic. Some key features of Vera's plastic program include the additionality requirement, and this ensures that a project activity demonstrates the collection or recycling of plastic waste beyond what would have likely occurred without the project. 
Also, there are the incorporation of social and environmental safeguards, which necessitates project proponents to confirm the absence of adverse impacts on the natural environment or local communities, including the informal waste workers, and independent third party verification that ensures compliance with all project standard requirements. This program covers all seven types of plastic and composite materials containing plastic. Moreover, a variety of project activities are eligible under VERA's plastic standard, including, but not limited to, recovery of ocean-bound plastic, development of municipal or private waste collection infrastructure, collection through waste pickers or the informal sector, and the operation of mechanical or chemical recycling facilities. Now I will pass it over to Kristen to share more about the process of developing a project with Vera's Plastic Program. Thank you, Kaylee. And for today's presentation, we are trying to keep it pretty high level. Um, as we know, we have a variety of stakeholders from different perspectives joining. So I will walk through some of the key details that will help you get started if you are interested in developing a project, but I would refer you to our website if you would like to dig deeper and get more information on what's required. So when we speak about the project life cycle of a plastic program project, there are a few key steps. The process is kicked off when the project proponent works on developing a project description. Here, they will document how they are meeting the plastic standard as well as the relevant methodology requirements and prepare um, their project description in line with the template provided by Vera. Secondary to this, they will list their project on the VERA registry, then initiating a 30-day public comment period where anyone is able to view their project document and ask questions or provide comments related to it. Next, the project will undergo validation. This is where a third-party auditor, referred to as a validation and verification body, or VVV, comes in and assesses how the project is designed to meet the requirements of the plastic program. Following the validation, the project will request registration, and this is where they will upload their final project description document as well as the validation report that was provided at the conclusion of the validation, and it will be um, submitted to VERA for review. In the next stage, after VERA has completed our review and registered the project, they are able to begin monitoring their activities. During this, the project will actually measure the amount of waste that's been collected or recycled, and they summarize this within a monitoring report, similar to what they did for the project description document. Once that monitoring report is prepared, it will undergo a verification by a third-party VVB, and this is where they will verify the amounts that the project is interested in issuing plastic credits for. After the verification has concluded, the project will request verification approval from VERA. Assuming the project is approved, then we will issue plastic credits for an amount corresponding to what is presented in the monitoring report. And the project is then able to sell those on to the buyers interested in them. I wanted to take a moment to touch on the validation and verification bodies. Again, these are the auditors that are tasked with assessing whether a project meets the plastic program requirements. There are currently seven VVBs approved to conduct audits for the plastic program. These are listed on this slide as well as our website. And on our website, you can find all of the contact information if you would like to get in touch with them. 
please note that projects are the ones that decide which VVB they work with, and they will contract and negotiate the terms of their services with them directly. Next up, we wanted to just highlight a few key documents um, to just familiarize yourself with the suite of, uh, of documents relevant to the PLASTIC program. So the PLASTIC program guide is the first document. This is where all of the details of the process relevant to, the, to registering and issuing PLASTIC credits is set out. The plastic standard then is the overarching requirements that all projects must adhere to. This will include those requirements for project start date, project configuration, social and environmental safeguards, stakeholder consultation, etc. And then the methodologies are where the activity specific requirements live. So the collection and recycling methodologies include the applicability conditions, as well as the steps for demonstrating additionality and those requirements for measuring and monitoring a collection or recycling activity. We have the plastic program definitions document that accompanies this suite of program documents to outline key terms that may be relevant to interpreting a requirement. And then lastly, we did want to highlight that the plastic program fee schedule can be found on our website. This is where you can get an overview of all of those fees that would be paid to Vera to register with one of our programs. And we do want to note that this fee schedule will not be inclusive of those fees that are paid to the VVB for their validation and verification services. Next up, um, I also wanted to take a moment to highlight the templates that are used when going through the project development process. So I've already referenced the project description and monitoring report. Vera provides templates for these on our website, and they include all of the relevant instructional text that is necessary for a project proponent to complete it or a VVB to complete it in the case of a validation and verification report. If you're interested in finding any of these documents, you can get to them on our website by going to the plastic program page and clicking on plastic program details. From there, you will find the rules and requirements and methodology sections, and you'll be able to find direct links to all of the documents that I have referenced here if you would like to dig in further. Hopefully, some of you are interested in potentially issuing a or registering a plastic credit project. And so we do want to highlight a few of the key things to keep in mind when considering eligibility. First off, a project must collect or recycle additional plastic waste, and they should be managing one of the seven types of plastic or the composite materials that contain plastic and maybe another item. So these are ex examples of these include beverage cartons or multi-layered packaging like chip bags or candy wrappers. And of course, these projects will need to meet all of the relevant plastic program requirements that are detailed in the methodologies and the plastic standard. I wanna take a moment to note that activities that reduce the amount of plastic produced are currently not within the scope of the plastic program. Um, so this includes those activities where maybe a project is creating an alternative material or installing a water refill station that reduces the amount of virgin plastic used. At this point in time, the program is focused on collection and recycling activities, though we may expand the scope of activities in the future. And next up, I did just want to take a moment to spend a little bit of time on one of the key eligibility criteria, which is additionality. For those not familiar, additionality is the concept that a project activity 
would not have occurred, or that is the collect the waste would not have been collected or recycled without the project. So it's additional if what they are doing is in excess of what would have most likely happened in the absence of the project. There are specific procedures for demonstrating additionality, and these are outlined in section seven of the methodologies where we've defined these steps. All projects have to start by establishing regulatory surplus, which is the idea that their activity exceeds the current regulations or regulatory compliance scenario. That meaning no one is forcing them to do whatever their collection or recycling activity is, forcing or mandating them to do that. But from there, a project has three potential ways to demonstrate additionality. There's the positive list, which we will touch on briefly on the next slide. There's the penetration rate, where a project can show that if the collection rate or the recycling capacity is below 20%, then the project is additional. And finally, there's the investment analysis where a project shows that their activity is just not economically or financially attractive. And to do this, they compare, they calculate the internal rate of return for their project and compare this to a selected benchmark. I mentioned the positive list and I wanted to take a moment to highlight a few additionality criteria um, should they be relevant to any countries in Latin America, which we are speaking about today. So collection activities located in least developed countries or small island developing states or special underdeveloped zones of a region are considered automatically additional, as well as recycling activities that are located in low income countries, rural areas of lower middle income countries, or special underdeveloped zones. And I know there is a lot of terminology here. The classification of income and um, you know, country designation, you should reference the methodologies for more detail in the references to where you can find that list of countries. Great. So we've covered some of the keys to developing a project and key things to keep in mind, but we also wanted to end by highlighting some of the plastic program projects that are using our program already. So on the next slide, we have a graph of the nearly 50 projects listed and 14 projects registered with the plastic program. Um, you can see that there are a handful in Latin America. There's um, one project listed in Haiti, another in Mexico, two in Colombia, and four in Brazil, with hopefully more to come. I think more broadly, you can see that this is a global program, so it really was designed to work and be applied in a variety of contexts, meaning that depending on where you are, hopefully, there is an opportunity for plastic credits to help to improve collection or recycling outcomes where it's needed. If you're interested in seeing more detail on the projects represented in that map, we would recommend you visit the Vera Registry, which serves as the central repository for all information on projects going through the process of registering with any of our programs. And it will, of course, include details of those projects that are registered, as well as the plastic credits issued. You can visit the registry and click on a project name to learn more about what the project is doing and how. We do have a few examples to speak through today, just to give more um, insight into what will be into what this program means on the ground. So um, there's one project in Thailand that is registered and is collecting and recycling plastic waste from hard to reach islands. So using plastic credits, they pay a premium to collectors to collect waste from these islands where it would just normally not be financially feasible for them to do so based on the cost to recover that plastic and what they could expect to get it from the market. 
This project also funds the sorting of collected fishing nets that can be recycled. It provides training, transportation, and PPE to collectors and recyclers and invests in regional initiatives to help boost the recycling of materials. Um, to date, they verified over 3,800 tons of plastic waste that's been collected and 300 tons that have been recycled. The next project is organized by Brascom. You may know them as a, a Brazilian company, but this project is actually based in the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, they're using an innovative technology to recycle and reprocess hard to recycle plastic waste into durable goods like pallets, heavy duty mats, and road plates, which diverts the waste from going to landfill and instead gives it another life. To date, they verified 14,000 tons of plastic waste processed at their facility there. The next project is located in Ivory Coast, but is actually organized by an organization called Conceptos Plasticos based in Colombia. This project works with female waste pickers to collect plastic waste from the local community. They then make plastic bricks out of the collected plastic waste and build schools as part of UNICEF's school building initiative. And as part of their greater activities, the social and environmental safeguards are very important to them. They've developed and implemented health and safety programs to reduce the risks and hazards associated with collecting plastic waste. And they also pay higher wages to those collectors, which creates a more reliable income stream for those collecting waste. And lastly, I wanted to highlight a project based in Ghana, which also is working with women entrepreneurs who are building their own plastic waste collection businesses. Through this initiative, they have also set up small recycling plants as social enterprises to help process plastic waste locally into shred and pellets that can then be used further in the manufacturing of alternative goods. And they, as part of this program, are working with local municipalities to increase plastic waste collection and community engagement surrounding waste management. And we wanted to include this because you may have heard of it already as it is um, being financed in part by the World Bank's Plastic Waste Reduction Linked Bond, which Kaylee will speak to a little bit more shortly. Um, to date, this project has collected nearly 2,000 tons of plastic waste and 500 plus ton, and recycled 500 plus tons of plastic waste. So hopefully those examples give you a little bit more context for what a project can look like. It would really vary depending on country, on the country where it's located, which allows for these projects to be designed to meet the specific needs of whatever Latin American country it is based in. Um, and hopefully these serve as good examples of that. But with that, I am done and I will pass it back to Kaylee to wrap us up with a little bit more information on the plastic program. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, so now that we have kind of covered an introduction to Vera's plastic program, plastic credits, how to develop a project and a few project examples, I want to dive a bit deeper into how Vera's plastic program can serve as a financing mechanism to address the plastic waste management challenge. So earlier I mentioned this $40 billion funding gap that needs to be addressed to set up and scale waste management infrastructure and mitigate pollution. And this is where Vera's plastic program can serve as a proven mechanism to mobilize finance from a variety of sources to address legacy plastic pollution and control further leakage through establishing and scaling efficient collection and recycling systems. Um, and our program is 
specifically relevant, I think, for regions like Latin America and Caribbean that are disproportionately affected by plastic pollution and may not have access to adequate resources to set up and scale those activities. So there are several sources of existing funding, meaning sources from where finance can be unlocked for a range of plastic waste management interventions. These include things like the private sector, public and government funding, development banks and financial institutions. And there are also several means of channeling these funds through things like the outcome-based bonds, multilateral funds, global plastic pollution fee, extended producer responsibility, and or voluntary contributions. And Vera's plastic program can serve as a link between the sources of finance, the implementation approaches, and high quality plastic waste collection and recycling projects, because it can be integrated into a variety of these financing mechanisms. And so I'll talk a little bit more about the how of these different examples, starting with the Global Plastics Treaty. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the International Legally Binding Instrument to End Plastic Pollution. If not, the instrument is expected to include both binding and voluntary approaches to addressing the full life cycle of plastics. Additionally, there are many conversations as we speak about how member states are going to finance the possible core obligations of the treaty. This is actually one of the topics being discussed during the intercessional work at the end of the month. And Vera's plastic program and plastic credits can be leveraged in a variety of ways to meet these core obligations proposed in the ILBI. So for example, driving finance to projects that improve recycling systems and increase the availability of recycled feedstock, mobilizing private and public sector investments to establish and scale up waste management systems, particularly in vulnerable geographies, mandating social safeguards to support fair and equitable compensation and preventative health and safety practices that enable a just transition, and supporting EPR or extended producer responsibility schemes at various levels of maturity to enhance the effectiveness of monitoring and verifying protocols and social and environmental safeguards. Another example is the recently announced plastic waste reduction linked bond that Kristen alluded to earlier that will leverage plastic credits issued by Vera to provide returns to bond investors. So this bond supports two projects, one in Ghana and another in Indonesia. Currently, the Asase Foundation project in Ghana that was mentioned a few slides ago is registered with Vera's plastic program and the Sea Circular project in Indonesia is in the process of being registered. Around 40, 14 and a half million in interest that would traditionally have been anticipated by the bond investors has been routed to the projects in the form of upfront financing. Under this innovative approach, the bonds investors will receive interest linked to the sale of the plastic credits the projects generate instead. So the credibility of Vera's plastic program and the robustness of the requirements are really providing confidence to a broad range of investors who want to support plastic waste management in these key regions. And we just talked about plastic credits and how they can support many objectives being discussed. And concurrently, national governments are implementing a variety of voluntary and regulatory measures to meet their specific plastic waste management goals. A common example of this is Extended Producer Responsibility, or EPR. EPR is a producer-focused mechanism that makes waste producers responsible for recycling and safely disposing of the waste they generate through their products and packaging. In Latin America, there are several existing and emerging EPR schemes today in countries such as Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay. However, developing and enforcing EPR can be challenging, particularly when resources are limited. 
So Vera's plastic program and plastic credits can really play a crucial role in supporting these EPR schemes. For example, governments can incorporate plastic credits into their national EPR schemes, providing a flexible compliance pathway for obligated parties while easing the administrative burden on government. Projects under VERA's plastic program could receive funding from EPR schemes with producer responsibility organizations confident that these projects are vetted adhere to a global measurement framework and are following rig rigorous social and environmental standards while benefiting the local community. Vera's plastic program can also serve as a monitoring and verification framework, ensuring that projects financed through the EPR scheme are effectively tracking their impact. Lastly, I'll just touch on voluntary contributions. So as these regulatory measures continue to evolve, voluntary contributions are going to remain a key way for organizations to finance projects aimed at reducing plastic pollution. And these contributions are crucial for making an immediate impact while these global and regional policies are being developed. By purchasing plastic credits, companies can take proactive steps to address their plastic footprint. This approach also allows them to measure the impact of their investments, support the development of scaling infrastructure needed to increase the availability of recycled content to support them in meeting their own recycled content goals. And additionally, it helps reduce the internal due diligence required for vetting these types of investments. So we touched briefly on the benefits of corporates investing in waste management activities through plastic credits, but I also wanna talk about how companies can use plastic credits in their corporate plastic stewardship strategies. So corporate plastic stewardship entails an integrated strategy involving upstream and downstream activities that aim to reduce plastic use and leakage. An integrated approach to a corporate plastic stewardship begins with measuring and quantifying the plastic used across the organization's value chain, as well as assessing how much leaks into the environment. Once the plastic footprint and leakage are known and understood by the organization, they can focus on efforts for reduction and management of the organization's plastic waste. Lastly, the corporation should clearly and transparently communicate about its plastic footprint, the reduction in management efforts, and any investments made into waste management activities. But I wanna narrow in a bit on the reduction in management pieces of a corporate plastic stewardship strategy. Reduction strategies include eliminating unnecessary plastic, redesigning products and packaging for reuse or recycling, and increasing recycled content. Management activities involve financing the plastic waste collection and recycling infrastructure to ensure proper waste management at end of life. The two activities should really happen in parallel to address both upstream and downstream contributors to plastic pollution. And why is this so important? Well, a company could do everything within its control to redesign products and packaging, for recyclability, but ultimately, if waste management infrastructure doesn't exist beyond their value chain to effectively recycle or manage those products and packaging at their end of life, they're still going to end up as pollution. Similarly, without proper end of life waste management infrastructure, companies may not have access to the amount of recycled content that they need to incorporate into their products and packaging. So through the integration of plastic credits within a corporate strategy, a company can support the setup and scaling of the needed infrastructure to increase recycled content, claim immediate impact, minimize social and environmental risks associated with projects, and even use plastic credits to meet their EPR compliance where applicable. So lastly, before we go into the Q&A, I think there's already kind of been some questions about plastic credits and the market. And so I'll touch briefly on it to the extent 
that I can, as Vera is an independent standard setter and not engaged in the selling of plastic credits. Um, projects, project proponents are really the ones responsible for selling these credits, which can be done in a variety of different ways. So there's kind of direct sales to interested buyers using brokers or intermediaries, as well as marketplaces. And traditionally, we really see companies being the ones that purchase these credits to support their plastic waste um, commitments that they have made. Additionally, on the price of plastic credits, again, Vera does not track the price of plastic credits. However, we do expect the price to vary based on a variety of factors, which can include things like the location of the project, the end destinations of plastic waste, material type or format that's being collected and or recycled, the type of project activity, or social impact or other initiatives that the project is participating in. But ultimately, that price will be determined by the market. And I think that brings us to the Q&A. Um, so maybe just give us a moment and we will try to get some of your questions answered. Thanks, Kaylee. I know I've been trying to keep track of the questions that have come in. Um, again, just a reminder, if you have any other questions, send them through. There were a good handful uh, related to the price of plastic credits, market demand, et cetera. Um, and I think you've covered those in that last section. So maybe I will take a moment to answer a few questions related to project eligibility. Um, there was one question related to, someone asked, is it possible to register a project that's already underway? And then another person asked, what the eligible period of a plastic project was. So I think I can answer these in tandem. What you need to know is projects establish a start date and that would be associated with either the initiation of a new project activity or the capacity addition to an existing activity. So maybe they add a line to a recycling facility or implement a new process that allows them to collect more plastic waste. That would be the project start date. And the project has to be validated within two years of that start date, meaning they need to prepare that project description and undergo the third party audit. So in that sense, a project could have already begun their operations and then decide to proceed with registering or verifying um, their activities, assuming it's additional and you know they've determined that they would benefit from plastic credit finance, but they would need to keep that two-year timeline in mind. Um, and along with that, maybe I'll answer one other question, which was, are donor funded or assisted plastic waste collection or recycling projects eligible? I think this question is getting at, can a project be receiving finance from other sources and also pursuing plastic credits? The answer in short is technically yes. Of course, you should always consider the project's need for plastic credits. So if it would be funded otherwise, and would have happened in the baseline scenario, then maybe it is not um, a good candidate for plastic credits. But what we do know is sometimes other funding sources are unstable or not dependable. So maybe a project might look for a variety of sources, such as grants, um, donations and revenue from plastic credits. And in this sense, it is fine for a project to receive funding from a variety of sources. Um, let's see. Oh, Kaylee, maybe you can answer this one. There was one other question about just generally what's the status of the standard? Are projects already registered and validated? I know I spoke to this a little bit earlier, but just in case it wasn't clear, could you answer that one? Yeah, happy to. Yeah, so the standard is 
um, or the program itself is about three and a half years old. So it is an active um, program and standard with the two methodologies, one for waste collection and one for waste recycling. And I think with that map that we had showed, you can see that there are already um, many projects that are both registered as well as listed. So again, there is about 50 plus projects that are in some stage of that process of registering with the program and about 14 projects that are actively registered. Again, you can find all of that information on Vera's, plus, or Vera's registry um, and kind of get the details on the different projects and specifics on what types of projects they are, where they're located, and all the documentation that goes along with those. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll get back to a few other eligibility questions. Someone asked um, if a project that transforms plastic waste into plastic wood is eligible. This will really depend. If the project is involved in the collection and they are um, using, collecting the plastic waste and then reprocessing it into plastic wood, they might be eligible for plastic collect waste collection credits. On the recycling side, it's a little bit more complicated. Generally speaking, activities are only eligible if they are creating a recycled plastic waste that can displace the use of virgin plastic. So as the name plastic wood, uh, I think says, traditionally wood is not made out of plastic. So that type of um, end of life would not be displacing the use of virgin plastic and may not be eligible for waste recycling credits. However, there is one exception for composite materials, since we know that these are a little bit more difficult to recycle under other technologies. So sometimes these um, projects that are recycling composite materials can use alternative ends of life like durable construction materials or furniture where maybe they are not displacing the use of virgin plastic per se. So hopefully that answers that for whoever asked. Um, and there was one other great question that somebody asked related to project eligibility. They wanted to know about the relationship between EPR and the additionality of a project. This is going to be, uh, this is a complicated one to answer simply because it really will depend. Generally speaking, if there is extended producer responsibility implemented in a region, it's operating successfully, it's driving high collection and recycling outcomes, then it's unlikely that that project would be able to meet the requirements to register with the plastic program. It's, it, you know, a key piece is they need to show what would have happened in the baseline scenario. And if in the baseline scenario, the EPR would have driven the collection or recycling of that plastic waste, then it's likely not going to be eligible for plastic credits. Now, we know that that it's not always a black or white issue because EPR does take a while to be implemented. Sometimes it's passed, but it's just not implemented or enforced in a way that's increasing the collection or recycling rate. So in these cases, the project still might be able to demonstrate additionality for what they are doing. Um, if they can show that the collection and recycling rates are low despite the existence of extended producer responsibility. And the last thing I would say is you should consider that extended producer responsibility doesn't always cover the full scope of plastic materials. So maybe it covers PET, but the project is processing flexibles or films. And in that sense, um, the existence of EPR as it applies to another material type would not impact the additionality of a project that recycles a different material, collects or recycles a different material. 
Um, these are some great questions and just trying to look, I think we've touched on a lot of them. Maybe Kaylee for the last one, last few, somebody asked this question and I just want to make sure everyone is clear about the distinctions between plastic credits and carbon credits. So somebody asked how much a ton of recycled plastic is worth in the carbon market today. Could you answer this, Kaylee, and maybe clarify for everyone how they should consider a plastic credit versus a carbon credit? Yeah, happy to. Um, so there are kind of no requirements in the plastic program that would preclude a project from generating plastic credits and carbon credits, but there is a distinction between generating carbon credits and plastic credits. Um, so I think the plastic credits would be generated based on the plastic waste collection and recycling activities. And a project has to demonstrate conformance with the rules and requirements of the plastic standard and then the relevant methodology that would be eligible to generate those plastic credits. Um, and then if the project is interested in generating carbon credits, then they would have to be conform conformant with the requirements of the relevant methodology used for issuing carbon credits on a recycling activity project. Thank you. Um, I saw one more question I don't think I got to and I, then I think we can wrap it up. Um, it's also eligibility related. Somebody asked about do certified compostable plastics qualify for plastic credits through collection or recycling projects? Understanding that composting is a form of waste recycling or and they asked if that was within or outside the scope of the methodology. What I would say here is you need to consider if the project is collecting or recycling those compostable plastics. So just creating compostable plastics um, or using them would not be an eligible activity, but if they're collecting plastics um, that maybe are PLA or made out of an alternative non-petroleum paste based plastic, they could be eligible for maybe collection credits per se. Um, but for recycling credits, they will need to show and demonstrate the closed loop recycling of the plastic waste. And to my knowledge, there aren't as that many applications where a compostable plastic can then be processed into a material that can be used again in manufacturing. But if it can, then maybe it is eligible for waste recycling credits. Um, oh, let me ask, answer one thing just to be abundantly clear, because I know we did touch on it in the presentation, but I see one more question about it. Um, somebody asked if you can, or what the price of a ton of a plastic credit is today in the market. Kaylee, could you answer this one just as a refresher? Sorry, I think I froze, Kristen. I didn't catch yes, what you This question said. was just about the price of a plastic credit. Oh, yes. So again, Vera, as a standard setting organization, um, doesn't participate in any of the pricing or transactions of the plastic credit. Again, there are two types of plastic credits, the waste collection credits and the waste recycling credits. And the price will really depend on a variety of different factors, including geography, local context, material type, activity type, um, and so it's really hard to put like a specific price range due to all of these factors and variabilities, but the price will be kind of determined by the market. So hopefully that helps clear things. Thanks. And I saw one more question, so I just want to get to it before we actually wrap up. Um, somebody asked if we could clarify how additionality is ensured if the project is generating both plastic and carbon credits. So this is where the project has to defer to the specific additionality requirements of whatever carbon methodology they're using. 
as well as the plastic program methodology that's applicable to their activities. So they would demonstrate additionality that way to show that either the emission reductions would likely to not have occurred or that the plastic waste would most likely have not been collected or recycled without the activity. Um, but similar to how a project can generate different units under some of our programs, such as um, you know, a project can issue a VCS, a VCU or carbon credit, as well as label it with an SD Vista asset or a SD Vista label or generate an SD Vista asset. When you're the distinction is that you are quantifying different types of benefits and thus they do not overlap there. So hopefully that resolves any questions there. If not, I think on the final slide, we've got an email inbox that we would encourage you to send any follow-up questions to. You can write to the plastic standard at vera.org and we would ha be happy to um, yeah, provide guidance or answer questions where we can. But otherwise, I think that is all from me. Kaylee, um, I'm not sure if you have anything else. Otherwise, I will let you wrap us up. No, thank you. Um, just appreciate everyone attending and asking some really great, great questions. Um, and again, if we didn't get to a question or you have any questions that come up, please feel free to reach out. This recording will be available on Vera's YouTube, but appreciate everybody taking the time today. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.